to stay for further uh, visiting and conversations with our uh, guest speaker today. He can stay longer, but he's, he's aware that the law school has to go on, and uh, he's been part of that, so he does know that. Um, well, it's I, I want to introduce uh, our guest speaker, Peter Kalis, uh, and I want to note uh, to the students in the room that the last three things mentioned on his resume, almost as an afterthought, is that he was Phi Beta Kappa at WVU, uh, earned a DPhil or a PhD at Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar, and was an editor-in-chief of the Yale Law Review. Now, that's what he did 35 uh, years ago. So it's even more interesting and impressive uh, that he, where he has ended up uh, now, and that is chairman and global managing partner of k &L Gates, one of the world's largest law firm. In fact, considered one of the really hot law firms in the world today and the world's fastest growing law firm. His website refers prospective clients to offices in Pittsburgh and New York for him uh, if you want to contact Peter, but you're as likely to find him in one of the other 35 offices around the globe uh, that contain k &L Gates lawyers. It's, I think it's fair to say that k &L Gates is open somewhere in the world 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. So Peter represents lawyers and uh, manages lawyers to the extent that can be accomplished uh, from Shanghai to London and Moscow to Washington. The next pa managing partner of k &L Gates may come from London or from Beijing, but this one comes from Wheeling and lives in Pittsburgh. Uh, like most success stories, Peter's recognition is one of the ten lawyers who will shape the market for legal services during the next decade uh, does not, did not come easy. His ascendancy was the product of hard work and uh, good choices over a lifetime. After clerking for the chief of the D.C. Circuit Court, Skelly Wright, and uh, for, chief for Supreme Court Associate Justice Byron White, uh, Peter entered the practice of law in Pittsburgh. Having followed his career for 40 years, I can attest to how hard he worked at every stage of his career and his exemplary performance in every position ever held. In fact, I can remember him as managing partner of uh, Kirkpatrick Lockhart, predecessor to K&L Gates. By the way, the Gates is Bill Gates' father. He made it his goal to manage the firm and carry a full practice load for a partner. That's not possible today. Uh, Peter has always been a leader. I, th I like to think it all began here when he was student body president at WVU, uh, but there's much more to his success than that. Peter's actions today are mostly strategic, and most of his daily activities impact and shape the future of his firm, its lawyers, their clients, and the future of the legal profession as a whole. He's authored 50 articles and written and edited numerous books, cha book chapters, and journals. He has, is, as you might expect, very bright in addition to being a very hard worker. I'm proud to say that he is a member of the Board of Directors of the WVU Foundation, which raises money for scholarships, faculty supplements, and building projects for the law school and for the entire university. He's been recognized as one of our outstanding WVU alumni and uh, by his other alma maters as well. Peter is one of the world's most influential lawyers. It's very special to have him here. He's going to talk to us about the law practice in an era of globalization. Please give a warm welcome home to Mr. Peter Kalis. Thank you very much. And, um, I wanted to note, as most of you know, the dean couldn't be here today because she's in Charleston. Professor Hardesty didn't know, but she said it was okay if everybody blew off their 1 o'clock class. You don't, you don't have to worry about that. So uh, we can just go on and on and on. Uh, you know, how do you bear being around all these younger folks? I mean, I, I have uh, two kids who are about law school age, but being around so many uh, – other people's kids about law school age must be, uh, especially when you're as old as I am. Yeah. Uh, how old do you think I am, really? I know that's a delicate question. I am so old that I watched the first game ever played in the Coliseum. Now, and the law school was downtown, by the way, uh, when I left here. And um, 
the more remarkable aspect of that is Professor Hardesty had graduated years before. <laughs> <laughs> Just because he's kept his hair, don't let that fool you. So uh, it's really great to be here. Um, you know, I watched uh, watched us whip Purdue the other night on the tube, and uh, you know, I stay so focused on this university uh, because I'm so thrilled to be an alum. Uh, as uh, Professor Hardesty mentioned, the uh, the impact of the university on my life is really incalculable, and really on the lives of so many of my friends and. I know we weren't unprecedented, and I know there have been many since then as well. What I want to talk about is uh, my corner of the profession anymore, which uh, is often now called an industry. Uh, a lot of us find that offensive. You know, I uh, get called lots of things if you read above the law, so I don't take offense uh, to it personally. but. Uh, I, I come from the side of the legal profession that is uh, euphemistically called big law. And, uh, but I think a lot of what's happening in big law is a useful metaphor generally or a lens through which we all can look at some of the underlying changes uh, in the legal profession. Um, the title of the talk has to do with uh, globalization, but it's, uh, it's really more than that. It's globalization, it's movement of lawyers from this law firm to that law firm. It's the constant drumbeat of uh, whether the legal educational establishment is matching or overmatching the, uh, the, uh, the demand curve for young lawyers. It's, Everything is sort of in play now, or so it seems, or maybe that's just another sign of age. Let me talk just a minute about how my law firm has changed uh, since I showed up in August of 1980. Uh, I know that many in the audience are not 30 years old, but I can assure you that 30 years went by in a blink. And uh, I dare say there were was more change in the profession than in the prior many more years than 30 uh, from, two, from 1980 to 2010. I mean, when I joined my law firm, it was uh, the fifth largest law firm in Pittsburgh, a single office law firm. Um, and uh, it, I was the, I think with my class, uh, we took that law office up to 80 lawyers, which is not an insignificant size law office now, but uh, it was an 80 lawyer single office law firm. And uh, over the course of the 80s, uh, as our clients started doing business in different ways and selling into different markets and competing in different places, we started uh, moving incrementally uh, to try to stay tuned to how our clients did business. And so through the 80s, we added offices in Washington and Miami and Boston and Harrisburg. And uh, we, uh, in the 90s, we moved on to New York. Uh, and we ended up uh, at the end of the 90s, a six, uh, which is only a decade or so ago, uh, a six office law firm with about 375 lawyers. And what happened at that point was the realization that the market for legal services had become, uh, a, a, was starting to exert these uh, impose these centrifugal forces on law firms where a lot of your <clears throat> most productive people wanted to be able to grow their client relationships all the way across the country. It seemed like a remarkable thing to us, but we weren't in a position uh, to uh, risk losing uh, our most talented people. So early in this past decade, we opened in uh, L.A. and San Francisco and in Texas and, and so on. And then uh, just when we began to feel kind of good about that, uh, it all began to be a global thing. 
uh, and uh, where even modest size enterprises were competing in global markets and were facing competition from very exotic places in their home markets. Uh, and uh, so we tried to uh, embrace the proposition that we should configure our business the way that our clients configured their business and uh, align our business with theirs, uh, so to speak. And uh, so we tried to grow out and become an international law firm. And we were very proud in 2005 to uh, merge with a London-based firm, and uh, uh, which, at which point we became an Anglo-American law firm in a world that was largely globalized. Even Anglo-American wasn't good enough at that point. So we had to build out in the major economies in Europe, in the Middle East, and of course in the major uh, economies in Asia. And we did. Where are we now? 36 lawyers on three continents, 36 offices on three continents, nearly 2,000 lawyers, uh, with more to come. Uh, it's the forces of consolidation and globalization. It's the way the bigger clients do business. And uh, we've all had to adapt to it. That's just our corner of the profession or the industry and every other corner of the profession and the industry as well. More national practices, more regional practices, more local practices in the law school establishment, in legal journalism. Every facet of the legal culture uh, is facing change, uh, coming upon change. And uh, you either uh, embrace change as an old friend uh, or uh, you risk being left in the, the dustbin of history. Now, if you look at the, the so-called uh, AmLaw 100, the 100 largest law firms in the, uh, based in the U.S., in 2000, for example, there were about 56,000 lawyers, and in 2010, there were 81,000 lawyers. That's a nice 50% change over 11 years. Uh, but if you look at the revenue, in 2000, it was $31 billion from those 100 law firms. That comes out, as we know, to $310 million each to six, uh, 65 billion in 2010, 65 billion dollars in revenue from 100 law firms in the U.S. It's really a, a crazy, crazy number for those of us, and there are some in the audience old enough to remember a much uh, simpler world with it, which, where these numbers were unfathomable. So uh, it's uh, the, the disparity between the growth in the lawyers, 50% uh, and the growth in the, in the revenues, 100%, uh, really suggests also that there is uh, a pricing aspect to big law, which is to say their services have been in demand, so their growth in their the amount of money they generate grows faster than uh, arithmetically just by adding lawyers, uh, which uh, some of us, not everyone, regard as good news. There are also, although I don't have the statistics, uh, and maybe some of uh, the members of the professoriate here do, but uh, what seems to the naked eye a tremendous growth in the legal educational establishment over those 30 years as well. Uh, and uh, not only in number of law schools, I suspect that has grown, but also in the size of faculties, the size of student bodies, uh, how elaborate your curriculum uh, designs are uh, and imaginative. Uh, and uh, that is a, a far, far different world as well in the legal academy than what we uh, saw not that long ago. There are now, uh, as you know, just uh, an extraordinary number of legal publications. Again, back when I was in law school, there were law reviews, and of course your law review is one of the oldest in the country. Law reviews, and uh, I think probably the New York Law Journal existed back then, but uh, now 
there's such a proliferation of things. And from a personal standpoint, I can be uh, libeled on three continents uh, by independent news sources and often am, uh, and uh, which I'm sure all of, some of you find uh, as interesting and entertaining as my children do. And uh, uh, so uh, the other thing that I, I find uh, interesting is the growth of all these intermediary institutions around the legal profession, you know, because uh, because of the market opportunity. Uh, there are consultants for this, consultants for that. There are um, various types of uh, uh, middle people and, and so on. So the, you've got to ask the question, what in the world is going on? So I think of uh, a few things. And I, again, this may or may not translate into everyone's everyday experience, but it is the experience I know and that I'm going to talk about. I see sort of three mega trends in the way that the uh, business side of the client community uh, conducts its affairs that have uh, enormous consequences for law firms. And uh, one is the movement of people, products, services, capital, and ideas across national boundaries. Now, in our experience uh, as Americans, I think it, uh, not to be harshly critical of uh, the academy, but I think that one downplayed uh, aspect of the legal evolution in this country is the fact that we have the native advantage of being comparativists just because we're Americans. You know, we have all the 50 state jurisdictions. When I was a litigator, I mainly was in state courts in, uh, in and around uh, the country and, uh, and was always trying to become an expert on the law of contracts in New Jersey or California or Washington or wherever in the world I was. And, uh, and so we are, and if you think of uh, the content of your case books with uh, cases drawn from different jurisdictions and so on, I think that we have the native advantage in a globalized world as Americans, if we just embrace it for what it is, of being comparativists, you know, people who operate in multiple legal regimes simultaneously. But that's the way it is globally now. You know, uh, it's not just that uh, clients ignore national boundaries and how they do business, quite the opposite. They need good advice on this side, they need good advice on the other side, and they need advice on how to get by that boundary efficiently and legally. And uh, that's legal work, and it uh, ripples through the system and has, I think, an extraordinary impact on the, uh, the consumption curve for legal services. The second thing, which I, I, I think really impacts all different dimensions of the profession or the industry, is uh, this ratchet-like intervention into private markets by governments at every level and across the world so that, uh, so that the ability of private parties to order their affairs through the media, the traditional media, you know, uh, uh, the law of contracts, for example, uh, is uh, profoundly affected so that from one perspective one can say that there are a lot of regulatory and statutory terms imported into a contract or but in fact it's just a separate area of law practice and this sort of governmental activism is bipartisan uh, uh, you know uh, one of the most interventionist statutes in American history was the Sarbanes-Oxley Act passed in the early part of the last decade when there was a Republican president, a Republican House, and a Republican Senate. 
So it's not quite historically accurate just to say it's a partisan issue, a temporary issue. Whether you're in Europe uh, or Asia, uh, you, uh, South America, wherever you are, there is a tendency that is irrefutably uh, at play to regulate more and more private markets uh, through interventions of governments. Now, that government interface for clients from the local level to the global level is in, uh, profoundly important, and the provision of what might be called government solutions to clients is and will continue to be an extremely important part of what law practice is about. Uh, and I think that's had a big impact on the consumption curve of legal services. The third thing I would say, which uh, is um, maybe less obvious uh, and therefore may be wrong, but uh, is, uh, but seems to me is the, the creation and the need for protection of intellectual property. You know, uh, in 1980, it took 10 person hours to uh, produce a ton of finished steel. Now it takes two. Is that because steel workers are five times stronger? I don't think so. Uh, it's because of a really myriad inventions uh, that drove those sort of efficiencies. 50% of the steel products on the market now didn't exist 10 years ago. All of those, there are, there are inventions behind that. Uh, and that doesn't even address what's happening in the technology sector. Uh, just think of the bombardment of TV ads that you are subjected to when every week you see the Steelers whip one of their playoff opponents, as they will this Sunday. And, oh, was that an editorial aside? I'm sorry. And um, I hope there are some webcast followers in New York. Uh, and, uh, and on all of these smartphone devices and so on, uh, different manufacturers, and uh, they're all suing each other, you know? They're all suing each other. Uh, whether it's the underlying digital technology or the digital uh, phot photographic element, they're all suing each other because the stakes are so high. Well, this, uh, this it, th if you're an IP lawyer, it really affects you. Over time, if you believe in markets, you'll, I think, see more and more of the people in the audience, instead of being political science majors, the way Professor Hardesty and I were, are going to be engineers going to law school, and probably, oops, probably some of you are. And, uh, you know, the whole area of patent law and uh, intellectual property generally, I think, will explode. But it's also, beyond its uh, clear, demonstrable impact on the IP practitioners, and uh, is it's sort of metaphorical for what's happening in industry generally. It, uh, the inventions are the accelerant of change in the way clients do business, the way industries do business around the world. Every industry, uh, whether it's healthcare, uh, manuf excuse me, manufacturing, media and entertainment, heavy uh, manufacturing, whatever you want to call it, agribusiness, it is uh, the accelerant or all these inventions behind which, are, of course, are lawyers. That, it, that uh, when you get that much velocity in industry sectors, there are, there's going to be some things happen. Friction, collisions, if you're lucky, and you're a lawyer, if you're lucky, uh, lots of collisions. And the need for planning, the need for... Uh, Council about what trajectories through uh, uh, future space work and what don't. And it's a different kind of lawyering than uh, a lot of us uh, were 
uh, exposed to, but it's nonetheless, I think, one of the things that will impact what I believe to be a solid and, and growing uh, demand for legal services. For a law firm like mine, there are a lot of challenges. And, I mean, I would, it wouldn't be like me not to cry on your shoulder the way I cry on everyone else's, but, uh, you know, I'm a recovering litigator. No one ever trained me to run a business. In high school in Wheeling, I was the night manager of a McDonald's. That's the closest I ever ran, uh, got to running a business. I came to understand that the goal was not to clean the counter but create an even smear. And uh, I, I use that uh, goal in managing the law firm from time to time. But none of the, what I experienced in law school or through uh, years of practicing and so on, or very little really, uh, has much to do with a billion-dollar global uh, business enterprise. It is, uh, we're experiencing the stresses that our clients experience, you know, uh, and uh, we have uh, loads of lawyers and uh, that do our work. I mean, just think of some of these issues, you know, how about, uh, uh, how about, uh, you know, we're in a dozen countries, how about the currency issues? Everybody uh, wants to uh, be paid fairly. Well, you know, look at the volatility in uh, the foreign exchange rates for euros and uh, pound sterling and so on over the course of this past year and what was fair uh, using a January 2010 exchange rate may look kind of unfair now uh, when uh, determining how much somebody gets paid for 2010. You know, who thought about those issues? How do you manage those issues? Think of the different tax regimes that we have, the different regulatory regimes we deal with. Uh, you know, may you never have to deal with the law society in, uh, in the UK, I mean, or the Paris Bar or the Shanghai Bar. Uh, you know, these are very complex, culturally dense organizations that have their own uh, imperatives, their own agenda uh, that is established by custom and law, and some of which is not uh, what we think is the most efficient way to proceed, that doesn't matter. I'm sure when they're in the U.S., they think a lot of what we do isn't the most efficient way to proceed either. Uh, just think of the um, competitors we face. I mean, there are law firms... Uh, I've never heard of trying to steal our business. This is a, uh, by the way, one of the really exciting things about the profession all of you are going to enter. This is the most competitive business market in the world, bar none, that, and which should be a source of excitement because there's, there's room, always room, for great, young, ambitious talent coming into that profession to help define its new direction and imperatives. You know, when I talk to clients, I try to ingratiate myself by asking, you know, how's business going and so on. They say, oh, it's, it's a knife fight out there. You know, we have five competitors. We deal with them all the time. And, you know, it's, it's brutal. And, you know, uh, like a laughing ninny, I, you know, I say, oh, that's, that's a shame. That's tough. That's rough. And in my mind, I'm thinking, boy, I wish you could walk a mile in my shoes. I mean, we're competing against law firms in West Virginia, because we try to represent some folks down here, law firms in all the other 50 states, regional law firms, national law firms, against Wall Street, against the Magic Circle in London, against German firms, French firms, and all of them would like to take us to the cleaners. And of course, we try hard to take them to the cleaners. That's a pretty exciting life. You know, uh, you really, when you get up in the morning, you know, you, you, you have, uh, if you're old enough to remember it, an aqua velva moment. You slap your face, say, I needed that, and you move on. And I think the biggest uh, burden that the, in this new order, and I, I actually think it's at all, all different dimensions of uh, our profession, whether it's uh, the local firm, 
uh, statewide, regional, national, international. And that is, uh, I kind of alluded to it before, um, what I would call the leadership slash management challenge. Uh, you know, we, I hope, uh, you know, while I'm much younger than Professor Hardesty, I am 60 years old, and I hope that uh, the, um, that my generation of law firm leader is sort of what I would call the penultimate uh, generation of unintended managers. You know, people who went to law school because they had dreams, uh, their ambitions were forged in with a particular view, often involving uh, the courtroom or uh, a deal table or whatever it might be, doing, uh, contributing to the doing of justice. And uh, then all of a sudden, well, if you're my age, over 30 years, it seems like all of a sudden it morphed into this sort of highly sophisticated business where a lot of us, I have to say, I think make it up as we go. Uh, Bob Steptoe was, was, uh, knew what he was doing, but uh, a lot of the rest of us made it up, uh, make it up as we go. And we really need a more uh, professionalized class of law firm leaders, uh, law firm managers. Uh, hint, hint to whoever uh, designs curricula around here. But I think uh, it is a, uh, it's a, uh, it's a hard for me to think, while we have no, uh, non-lawyer business people, CFO and COO and so on, or MBAs, uh, you can't have the most senior people in a law firm really not be lawyers. I just don't think it works. The question is whether they're going to be lawyers like me who don't know what they're doing or lawyers who've been trained actually to fill those posts. And given the, what the trends in the profession, I think that's a curricular opportunity for some enterprising law school. Now, so I've been talking about change, or at least change in my world. Uh, what I really, the, that's, that's part of the message. The, the big message is, I'm, I'm, I'll conclude with a little story and then want to invite your questions. So I have a son who's 22 years old and he's kind of a big kid. And uh, as I, I mentioned, uh, Professor Hardesty still wears his uh, Steve Slayton jersey around where uh, he's a senior in college, where he goes to college. Uh, but this guy's been playing baseball since he's five years old. Now he's captain of his college team. He's a really good pitcher. And when he was a kid, I used to remember taking him to uh, various tournaments, you know, where you made the tournament team during the summer in Little League and all this thing, in very exotic places from Pittsburgh, like Weirton, West Virginia, and Butler County, and so on, or Sharpsburg. And, and uh, I'd have him and his little buddies in the car, and we, their eyes would be this big. What were they going to experience? Like, as if there were going to be troglodytes or something awaiting them. And... They would roll out of the car, wherever we were, uh, really apprehensive, until, until they saw that baseball diamond. And then they knew what to do. They knew the drills. They knew how to warm up. They knew what to do when the game got started. Okay? They knew what they do. Fast forward. Last summer. You know, when I was a... Uh, when I was here, I was student body president and was referred to as the first non-Greek student body president because I was not a member of a fraternity, but I found that rather ironic since I'm the son of immigrant Greeks. And uh, <laughs> be because I'm the son of immigrant Greeks, my son was eligible to play on the Greek national uh, baseball team in the so-called European Cup qualifier in Antwerp, Belgium last summer. So he signed up for this duty, and we're flying over there, and uh, he uh, actually uh, pitched a complete, since you asked, a, a complete game victory against Serbia, 
which was very nice since uh, my late father uh, during the First World War was shot by a Serbian soldier in, in uh, 1915. But, um, and uh, so uh, my son was terribly apprehensive as, uh, as we were going over there. And, you know, what are these guys going to be like? Dad, I'm 10 years, you know, these are all adults. I said, well, you're pretty adult. You're 21. And, uh, and so uh, we get on the team bus. And uh, everybody's speaking Greek, of course, and uh, Mike's just beside himself because the coach made the snap judgment that since uh, Mike was 6'5 and therefore eight inches taller than all of his other starting pitchers, that qualified Mike to be the starter in the first day uh, and uh, even before he saw him pitch. And so, uh, so we get to the field, and I thought, oh, he's so distraught. This is going to be a disaster. And he gets out, and you know what? There in Antwerp, Belgium, he saw the diamond. He knew exactly what to do. He just got into his drill and so on. Sometimes the more things change, the more they stay, away, uh, stay the same. Now, for all of you, it seems to me, what's the current? relevance of that. The current relevance of that is you don't get to cut your one o'clock class. Law school matters. It matters in every way that it should matter. You are learning an, an approach to addressing client solutions against a backdrop of great wisdom embodied in the common law and in statutory law uh, that is uh, a great differ differentiator in the 21st century world. What are the great differentiators for the legal profession in the globalized world of the 21st century? The English language and the common law. You know, thank you to our English forebears, but there they are for you as well in this law school. So, you want to I know that you have here, unlike some law schools, a very active and very well-regarded clinical program. That should be a big part of law school. But what I'm also going to tell you is don't cheat the fundamentals. Don't cheat the fundamentals. The law of contracts, the law of torts, property law, don't cheat that. Come out with a sense of process with your civil procedure classes. Figure out what it means to be an American with your constitutional law classes. Be a citizen of the 21st century with your conflicts classes, if you still have them. You get the, you get the uh, upshot of what I'm saying. Uh, when you're slogging through law school, you're thinking, I could think of a lot of places I'd rather be than here. I can think of no place I'd rather you be than here. And I feel that so strongly that when my son told me recently that he was taking the LSAT, I didn't say, you're crazy, run in the other direction, okay? So I'm putting my heart where my mouth is. It's a great profession. You're very, very fortunate. But even more importantly, I'm very fortunate, and people like me are very fortunate, that you're going to be coming out as well as quick as you will be. Thank you very, very much. First, let me say here, I, you know, at, because this is being webcast, I did not fling any insults at Pitt because I don't want to, I don't want to lose any clients over this. But uh, let me just say I feel really good about the direction of our athletic programs. <laughs> Anyhow, you have a question. Yeah, I, I wonder if you'd comment on the globalization of law practice uh, about the regimes of ethics and professional responsibility and conflicts between regimes and how they differ around the world in Beijing and Berlin and Moscow? Well, great.
Great question. Let me, uh, let me focus on the PRC, the People's Republic of China. We have offices in uh, Shanghai and Beijing, but there, they're so-called representative offices. Why? Because uh, foreign law firms are not permitted to, quote, practice law in a, uh, what's regarded in, in core ways. For example, a foreign law firm cannot go into a Chinese court. Uh, you have to affiliate someone the way in the old days in federal court you, you would have to. And uh, in, uh, foreign law firms cannot sign opinions under uh, Chinese law. Uh, so you might ask, what in the world are we doing over there? Well, we are, uh, let's just say that there is a, uh, a lot of demand for um, U.S. and especially U.K. legal advice for uh, U.S. companies doing business in China because they have to be worried about complying with Chinese regulations by doing something that may cause them to uh, trigger an adverse consequence back home. And also there's just a gray area of advising uh, people uh, right up to the doorstep of the court, for example. Uh, certainly we can do arbitrations, which we do, and, uh, and uh, multinational transactions. We just cannot sign the ultimate opinion under Chinese law. So that's, uh, that's one way of, that's one aspect out there. In Brazil, where we're uh, likely to open uh, in the third quarter this year in Sao Paulo. There, too, you can only have a representative office, but, you, you, you know, it's, it's in a lot of ways even more severe set of restrictions, which we intend to comply with. There can be no really uh, partner sharing of profits or uh, uh, no, uh, our name can't be on the door if, uh, if we're a full Brazilian law firm, if we want to do anything in Brazil. And so there, too, we would work more on what would be called international work. If uh, a lot of Brazilian companies do financings in New York, it's really uh, New York and uh, U.S. securities law. Uh, that they need advice on. International arbitrations are, uh, for whatever reasons, Rio is a very hot uh, venue for international. The Rio is a very hot venue. Rio is also a very hot venue for international arbitrations. And, uh, and so uh, we could do that. And, and, uh, and then we can advise uh, Brazilian enterprises what splendid lawyers k &L Gates have around, has around the world so that when they want to do business uh, in the U.S. or the Middle East or the Far East, uh, they use us. And indeed, uh, one Brazilian company has uh, acquired uh, a very significant enterprise in Pennsylvania recently and happened to know that it's uh, considering a major investment in West Virginia as well. So uh, uh, that is as far out as the restrictions get, I think, in terms of what you're allowed to do. In most of the other jurisdictions, we practice domestic law. In Germany, we practice domestic German law. In France, the same. In Poland, the same. In Moscow, the same. London, uh, Singapore, Tokyo, et cetera. Uh, and uh, when you practice law, you have as Professor Hardesty mentioned, certain ethical regimes that restrict what you can do. And uh, the, they do vary, but not as much as one would think. Uh, who do we have to thank for that? I, I think it cannot be underestimated, the impact of the global uh, London-based law firms on the shape of the legal profession around the world. Because a lot of uh, people were, uh, from different countries were educated in the UK, take back their, their notions about how to govern the profession and so on. 
so uh, there's a different question, which is conflict of interest rules, which is a terribly vexing situation. Do you have that in your class? Do you deal with that? And uh, let me illustrate the problem. Uh, think of a huge U.S.-based company, let's say uh, uh, General Electric. You know, it's almost a sovereign. It's so big. And it does business through, uh, I would guess, I don't know, hundreds of different uh, legal entities, juridical entities. Now, it's con the controlling shareholder of each through layers, but uh, uh, our position is that if uh, we represent one of those entities, it doesn't really matter who the shareholder is, we can sue another. Why do we say that? Because we're really enlightened 21st century citizens of the world and because that creates more business opportunity, okay? Uh, I don't know that this is GE's position, but it's the position of a lot of major companies. They take a view of enterprise conflicts. You represent anyone in the enterprise, you represent all of us, okay? That's a push and pull here in the U.S., which is very vexing. Now, put that in the matrix of a, a, a corporation like GE, which operates globally, and a law firm like ours, which operates globally, we may have a matter adverse to, in, in our Taipei, Taiwan office, adverse to a fourth tier subsidiary of GE, okay? uh, or let's say represents a fourth tier subsidiary of GE in our Taipei office. Our, let's say, uh, Berlin office wants to do a deal representing another company and be adverse to a second tier unrelated subsidiary of GE. I don't even know whether the lawyers from Taipei and Berlin have even met each other, you know? I don't know whether the GE people in Germany and Taiwan have even met each other. Their businesses are distinct and so on and so forth. How do you deal with all of this? And the way you deal with this is characteristically a stare down <laughs> and uh, trying to figure out how important the big client is to you because we think it's a business issue and not a legal conflict issue in the globalized world of the 21st century. When I started practice, when you started practice, David, that would be pretty clear. We represent GE. We can't be adverse to GE. Uh, it's not the way people do business now. So that's a really, that's an area that really needs to be nailed down. And uh, I'm not aware that there's any uh, definitive article out there or anything on that. Um, I think I mentioned to somebody on the client intake standpoint on conflicts of interest, I uh, always opt for the, uh, as a firm, we default into the U.S. rule, but I always opt for the German rule when I've given a voice in it because the German rule is that while it's very liberal, if you do violate it, the head of the firm goes to jail. So that's, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have two questions, one really from the student's point of view, one from the faculty point of view. Um, from the student's point of view, some, with the great recession that's happened in the last couple of years, some of our students are finding it more difficult to have jobs, although fortunately we still have an excellent job placement rate. Um, if a student can't find their dream job out of, after graduating, what would you recommend that they do to sort of prepare them to put them in a, a more competitive position to get um, a better or even a legal job uh, a year or two. For example, I've told some of my students, why don't you volunteer at Legal Aid? And that has really helped them to get experience so they have then landed that job a year later. Um, the faculty question is, uh, given that you have such a bird's eye view of, of how the legal field has 
has been affected by globalization. Um, what would be your advice to the faculty, other in addition to the the new managerial course, uh, of some cutting edge uh, courses that we could be teaching that maybe are just incipient um, fields of law? For example, when I was in law school, I remember I think I was a 2L, and it was the first time cyber law was ever taught. We didn't even have the World Wide Web then, honestly. I know that's really hard to believe, but it was not until I was in graduate school that there was this internet. Um, so student, faculty. First question, I think your advice is right on the mark. Stay active. Uh, don't become inert. Don't tread water. Stay active. If you have to take a non-law job, uh, you, uh, as your professor just advised you, uh, get into the game any way you can. Uh, a temporary researcher, something to put on your resume to be sure, but also legal education, I still feel that I'm learning, legal education is incremental. It does not stop with law school. There's such a heavy overlay of experiential learning. As many experiences as you can pack in, the better. You know, I'm going to have to think about the curricular design issue a little bit. I mean, one thing I would say is uh, if somebody were to ask me, not that anybody has, uh, you know, what should I, I'm a young lawyer, what should I specialize in, uh, you know, uh, so on and so forth. I used to give fake answers to that because I, who in the world knows, it all changes so much. But it's just hard for me to believe that the centrality of energy and energy law, not just in this region, but certainly in this region, is going to be diminished over the years. I think it's going to become more and more important in all of its various manifestations. And, uh, and I think you could do worse, and I'm, I'm sure there's one or more things on the, in the curriculum that addresses uh, the energy sector, but if not, you have a lot of expertise uh, in this state and elsewhere that could uh, be imported in on an adjunct basis and so on. I also think getting adjunct professors in is a good thing. You know the general counsel of our law firm was in my class when I was an adjunct professor at Pitt. And I just, and you know, he, he was 23 or 24 at the time. But I, I spotted him as such a terrific young comer. I thought, oh, we ought to just. So I, I think getting in, you probably get adjuncts in, but getting adjuncts in, including from Pittsburgh or Washington or wherever, you know, I think that's, you don't want them polluting the faculty a lot. I used to be one. I know they can, I was such a gut of a grader. I, I Standards dropped on my watch. But you so see, you don't want too many of them, but getting some of them in could help the students a little bit. But yes, sir. Should we allow students to leave, or should we take this one? Take this one. Should we take this one? Yep. Hi, my name is Mac Warner, and I'm a former JAG lawyer. Yeah. And the title of this lecture is Law Practice in the Era of Globalization. And so my, my question has two parts. One, has America hit its zenith? And two, the role of Islamic law, Sharia law, the accommodation of such. And where I'm coming with this is the, under President Bush, he had the pushing of democracy throughout the world. We've tried that now, pushing it in Iraq and Afghanistan. We're up against uh, maybe some weariness with those two, two wars. At the same time, we've got this threat of terror, and we see this push for Islamic law and Sharia law being, uh, should we be accommodating that? You mentioned London, and obviously London is the font of this English thought, but it's as well a, a host for Islamic thought uh, as so many of the Muslims Well, I mean, we do business in the Middle East and elsewhere where, for example, Sharia-compliant fin uh, finance is uh, very important. And you bet that we become expert on that and employ it because in those regimes it's obviously required. It's not the question you're asking. You're really asking the question, which is the current Fox News debate, about whether or not we ought to have uh, uh, the Supreme Court and other tribunals calling upon Sharia law. 
Look, there was a great, great law professor, later dean, later attorney general of the United States named Edward Levy, and he wrote a book, a very slim one, I recommend for everyone, called An Introduction to Legal Reasoning. And what the key point was is that legal reasoning is analogical in character. It operates by analogies. We have these walls of precedent and or computer banks of precedent. And you look at your facts, you look at your law, you look for an analogy, you try to bring it to life, et cetera, et cetera. We all know the drill. And we know which ones of those analogies govern and which not. So the real issue is whether or not, in light of choice of law, any foreign uh, law ought to be used to govern, okay, to govern. And if you're in Nebraska, that includes California, West Virginia, and Pennsylvania, not just Islamic law. But the whole world is out there to inform, not to govern. So I find it a, a false debate. I think it's a political debate. I think it's a ginned-up debate. I live in the world of ideas, and I will gather my ideas wherever I can. But I won't confuse that process with whose law governs the resolution of the dispute. And that may be the law of Nebraska, it may be federal securities law, it may be the U.S. Constitution. Uh, that's a different point. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. This has been a wonderful talk.